Hello and welcome to the sixth in the series of SDF's COVID-19 webinars. If you missed any of the previous five, please feel free to go over to SDF's YouTube channel and you can catch up on them there. My name is Kirsten Horsburgh and I'm the Strategy Coordinator for Drug Death Prevention at SDF and I'm very happy to be chairing today's session, we, which is on drug treatment and contingency planning in Scottish Prison Service under COVID-19. We've got three fantastic guests with us today who I'll introduce as we go through and they've kindly given up their time to join us today. I think it's fair to say that there's probably significant and quite unique challenges within the prison service under these pressing times. Um, and some of those challenges are not just, I guess, related to ensuring an outbreak of the virus doesn't occur, but also about contingency planning, ensuring that prisoner health care, essential prisoner health care still continues. Um, and also how to manage social distancing guidelines in a prison environment. So today's focus will specifically look at some of those contingency plans with a particular focus on drug treatment, naloxone provision, and the early release program amongst other things. So the idea for today is that each of the speakers will have 10 minutes each. And after uh, the three presentations have occurred, we will then get questions from yourselves. Thank you very much if you are joining us live today. If, you are, if you're new to GoToWebinar, you'll see the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please do input your questions throughout the three presentations um, and be assured that your questions don't appear to everyone. They'll only be seen by our comms team working hard in the background and will be collated by my colleague Austin Smith who will join us after the three presentations to collate those questions and to uh, get your answers from our panel. Uh, and also, we won't uh, reveal who answered the question, so if that's something that generally puts you off from asking a question, don't worry, we won't be saying uh, this question was from Gemma from the Borders, although Gemma from the Borders, feel free to ask questions, but we won't reveal who you are. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Leslie McDowell. Leslie is Head of Health Strategy with Scottish Prison Service. And Leslie, over to you. Hi there. Um, my name's Leslie McDowell. I am the Head of Health Strategy for the Scottish Prison Service. Um, and today, uh, Kirsten has asked if I would speak to you about what the SPS have put in place uh, with regard to contingency planning for uh, COVID-19. So, for anybody who maybe doesn't uh, know uh, the prison service, we have 15 prisons in Scotland, of which uh, 13 are public HPS prisons, and then we have two private prisons, which are HMP Addywell uh, and HMP Kilmarnock. Uh, on the 15th of March, which is when um, the SPS considered that the pandemic really took hold with, within uh, Scotland and the prisons. Uh, and on, on the 15th of March, we had 8,115 people in custody, uh, which was at about our normal um, at that time. Um, however, today we actually unlocked uh, 6,912 people were in custody as of today. Um, now, some of that is uh, due to uh, the fact that the courts uh, weren't sitting um, or the courts were sitting at a reduced capacity. Um, but also, uh, as Kirsten also alluded to, uh, there has been an early release uh, programme over the last uh, four weeks. Uh, but I'll, I'll uh, speak a bit more about that in a minute. The fact that we've had a reduction in uh, the number of people who are currently in custody has meant that we have been able to provide more and more people in custody with single cell accommodation. Um, and actually, because of our current numbers, 85% uh, of those who are in custody uh, currently have a uh, single cell accommodation. So when you're looking at how do you uh, prevent the spread of something like uh, COVID-19, single cell accommodation is absolutely paramount um, as part of that. So the early release programme um, is a part of the Coronavirus Scotland Act of uh, 2020. Uh, and it's been taking place over the last two, three weeks, with one more week, I think it is, to go. Um, and the, the Act allows for 
people who were serving 18 months or less and were within 90 days um, of their date of liberation could be considered um, for early release. However, there were other um, exclusions that may prevent somebody, so uh, somebody who was a violent offender, um, domestic violence markers, uh, things like that would have prevented somebody from being part of the early release. Uh, but today we have released uh, 264 people uh, from custody under the, the early release programme. While we have seen, uh, uh, as I said already, a decrease in the number of people in custody, that partly because of uh, the, re the reduction in the number of people going through our courts, uh, what we have started to see again is an increase in our remand population. Um, and this is uh, due to an increase in those being taken to court by police. So that's those who are being um, arrested by the police that go to court. Um, at the beginning of April, there was 165 people who were taken to court by police. Uh, that compares to last week, where there was actually an increase uh, of uh, up to 671 people. And normally, SPS can uh, expect to see about 20% of those who are taken to court by police will then be remanded and brought into custody. So that shows you um, that, that we are starting to see an increase. So while it's great that we're seeing a decrease in our numbers because of early release, um, the, the number has started to creep up again, um, and especially around our remand population at the moment. Right, next slide, Andy, please. So in February 2020, myself and uh, two of my colleagues, um, uh, from one from OD and somebody else from Strategy and Stakeholder Engagement, uh, started to have a discussion, probably actually uh, late January, about what was happening with at that time, what was called the coronavirus. Uh, and as we went into February, we all started to uh, become a bit more anxious about uh, what this would potentially mean if, if actually this did become a pandemic. So over the next two, three weeks in February, there were just three of us worked very, very hard on writing a, a pandemic plan. We dusted down our old uh, flu pandemic plans, which I think many organisations did actually. The, the, the pandemic plans from 2009. We dusted them down to see um, what we could use from our old plans. And from that, we developed a, our a coronavirus pandemic plan, which is a living document. And since um, it was first introduced, I think it was the 26th of February, we first um, introduced our pandemic plan. I think we've had maybe eight or nine um, versions since then. Um, and that's because we absolutely adhere to the advice of uh, Health Protection Scotland, Public Health England and the World Health Organisation. And, and I'm sure all of you uh, have noticed how quickly uh, the, the advice changes. And we have to make sure that we're keeping up with that. So whatever advice has been um, for the public and within Scotland and within the UK, we have to ensure that, that we're um, affording the same to people in custody. Next slide. So we set up a national corona response group, um, and from that group we asked every establishment, the private prisons and the uh, public prisons, to set up local corona response groups. And within those groups, uh, both the national and local groups, we had NHS representation, um, our trade union colleagues were part of it, Health Protection Scotland were part of the, the groups. Uh, as well as um, operational colleagues um, and uh, health protection, um, and also the National Prisoner Health Network are part of the groups as well. And firstly, we, we agreed what the national pandemic plan would look like, and then we asked establishments to put together their local uh, pandemic action plans. Um, so they would look at locally what did they have to do and what measures did they have to put in place um, to try and prevent. Uh, the spread of uh, corona. Uh, so there were three phases to the pandemic planning. So the first was prevention and planning. So right at the beginning of phase one, this was way before uh, the WHO had declared a pandemic. Uh, we started looking at what did we need to put in place that would prevent, hopefully, uh, COVID coming into the prisons in the first place, um, and what planning did we have to do, looking at things like PPE um, and, and safe systems of work. Then the next phase, phase two, was when we started to, to prepare and start to implement some of these 
uh, changes to our processes and policies, looking at things like um, our visits um, outside um, work parties. We have people who go on home leave. Um, what things did we have to possibly reduce um, as they would increase the risk of COVID being brought back into the prison environment? And then phase three was pandemic. And I'd have to say very quickly um, from the prevention and planning, we almost skipped phase two and went straight into phase three uh, because the WHO called a, a pandemic at that point. Next slide. So today, uh, a total of 533 people across all of our prisons have been held in isolation, and uh, they would be held in isolation for two reasons. Either one, they were symptomatic, so they might have been showing uh, some of the symptoms. They maybe had a new persistent cough, um, had a temperature, um, and I know that we now also would include if they had lost uh, a sense of taste or smell as well. So anybody who um, presented with a symptoms would be seen by an NHS healthcare professional, and if after that assessment it was felt that they potentially had COVID, then they would be isolated at that point. And we have to remember that at the beginning there was no testing being done either, so there really wasn't an opportunity to be able to test people to find out if they actually uh, had um, COVID. Uh, those who were um, symptomatic would be held in isolation for a minimum of seven days, and if at the end of seven days they were no longer symptomatic, then they were able to, to be back out in mainstream again. Um, as at the beginning, on our first week, I think we had about 108 people at the highest were in isolation at one time. Um, and as of today, we actually have 30 people in isolation, 21 of whom are symptomatic, and nine are close contact. So a close contact would be somebody who had either shared a cell with somebody who was symptomatic or confirmed, um, or who um, had been in close contact with somebody. So while we try to encourage a, a social distancing, there are times where um, people will have been in too close contact with somebody and they would therefore have to isolate as well. Just exactly the same as a household in the community where a, a family member had also uh, been symptomatic. We've had a small number of confirmed cases across um, all of our prisons now. The, the um, testing of those in custody has only been a fairly recent thing, just as it has been in the community. But actually, as of this week, all of our health boards are now testing uh, people in custody or who are symptomatic. And that, again, is in line with the UK guidance that states that anybody over the age of five who is symptomatic uh, should be afforded a test for COVID. We also have a, a, a group of people in custody who ha are considered to have um, um, are clinically um, extreme uh, risk and they're shielding. Um, and we we'll probably have about 35 people across the estate who have chosen to shield at this point. And I see Kirsten's face there, so I think I need to wrap up in a minute. <laughs> um, so just some of the other things just to say, sorry, on the next slide, Andy. Things that we had to look at as part of the key issues were, did we have to change the, 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 the shift pattern and look at a core day to ensure that we had enough staff um, to, to still run a regime? We had to look at safe systems of work. We had to look at how do we ensure that both our staff socially distance from each other, staff socially distance from people in custody, but also that people in custody can socially distance from each other. Uh, we had to look at access to PPE, and we, like everybody else across the whole of the UK and the world had uh, some difficulties at first being able to access um, PPE. Uh, partnership working was absolutely essential as part of this, and that was partnership working with our NHS colleagues, with our TUS colleagues, but actually also with people in custody who I have, have to say have really coped admirably with the fact that they have seen a massive change to their, their daily routine uh, throughout this um, pandemic. Um, setting expectations for those in custody with things like having to uh, stop visits because we saw the huge risk of uh, continuing to have visits where people potentially could be bringing COVID in. Uh, but then being creative and trying to find alternatives, so looking at virtual visits um, and access to greater access to um, emailing a prisoner as well, uh, and greater use of technology. Um, as we, we move forward, uh, as long as we're in this position. And I think I've just got one last quick uh, slide, um, which says, 
what we're doing next is we're looking at what does recovery look like? We potentially are going to be in this position for a while yet. Um, what do we do to be able to start to relax the regime and get people out and back into um, the, their work parties and back into education, but still keeping people safe? Um, and how do we help people accept that the, this is maybe the new normal for the next few months and actually what we were used to um, back in February is not what we will uh, see for the next few months. So that was really, uh, hopefully that's given you a flavour of what we've done within the SPS for contingency planning. Thanks a lot, Leslie. That's brilliant. <clears throat> really great uh, information there. I'm sure people's questions will be flying in for you at the end as well. Um, so thanks very much. And we'll just swiftly move on to our next speaker, who is Tom Byrne, who is National Prisons Pharmacy Advisor. So Tom, over to you. <coughs> thanks, Kirsten. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I was asked to speak about three topics. Uh, one is an overview of prison health uh, care. Two is an understanding of the risks of COVID-19 in the prison environment, particularly in relation to <coughs> the provision of opiate substitution treatment. And then just have a discussion with you about the, our contingency planning in relation to service continuity for opiate substitution treatment. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with a very high level overview of, uh, of where we are with prison health care. And, and Mary Mitchell, who's going to follow me, will give you some specifics about what's happening, I think, in the COVID-19 situation. So up until uh, the 1st of November 2011, people who were in custody with the SPS received their primary and community health care services from the SPS, uh, and that's uh, typical primary care services, dentistry, uh, dental services, opticians, pharmacy services, and that service was nurse-led. However, following a feasibility study, which was undertaken in 2007, uh, it was recommended to the Scottish ministers that the provision of uh, these services should transfer to the NHS, and that happened on the 1st of November 2011. Uh, it was recognised, I guess, at that point that the SBS had taken the service as far as it could, and actually the NHS did health, but the SBS did rehabilitation and other aspects of care. Uh, so care, healthcare best sat with the NHS, but also importantly, Scotland had signed up to World Health Organisation declarations that prison health uh, care should be part of the broader public health system, and that those in prison should have uh, access equitable access to services uh, those available in the, in, in the community. So moving to the NHS facilitated that. So when that happened, the 15 prisons in Scotland then had their services provided by the, uh, the NHS board in which they were located. Uh, and we have prisons located. So in Dumfries and Galloway, there's one prison. In NHS, yes, and Arne, there's one. In Greater Glasgow and Clyde, there's three. Lanarkshire has one prison. Fourth Valley has three, uh, Lothian has two, Tayside has one, Highland has one, and Grampian has one. <clears throat> Secondary care services continue to be provided by those as they always have been. Uh, the service remains nurse led, and there's three core components to the service provision that's primary care, mental health, and addictions. There are standards for the health and well being that's delivered in prisons, and these were developed in collaboration between. The NHS, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, the Scottish Prison Service, and Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons, because HMCIP still retain responsibility for inspection all aspects of prison life, including health. There are quality indicators in these standards, and they're based on uh, a human rights approach uh, to the delivery of care in prisons. And these standards and quality indicator statements are the basis of the inspection of prison healthcare services, and that inspection is undertaken by Healthcare Improvement Scotland through a framework arrangement with HMIP. So following the transfer of services from the SPS to the NHS back in, uh, in November 2011, uh, a, a national prison healthcare network was set up to oversee that transfer and to uh, develop and share best practice in relation to healthcare uh, within prisons. Uh, <clears throat> however, Following the report, uh, publication of the report some five years later by the Royal College of Nursing called the Five Year On Report, looking at prison health care uh, and the subsequent Health and Sport Committee inquiry into, uh, into prison health care, which was published in May 2017, uh, a decision was taken to review that network structure and to update it. And that's now happened. So we now have a new national prison care network that has a uh, new staff, new focus, new funding. Uh, and it is really focused on you know, delivering improvements in health and social care across the prison setting. 
uh, that group uh, has identified facets that it wants to take forward in relation to health and social care, but is now is currently focused on COVID-19 activities, but will pick up the broader, broader health and care activities uh, as we return to a new normal. So that's a, kind of a, a flying overview of where we are with uh, healthcare services and prisons at the moment. So I just want to move, quickly move on to the risks associated with COVID-19 in the prison environment. And uh, Andy, if you could stick up that, 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 that second slide that I've got for me just now, uh, that, that would be helpful. Uh, the, so public health modelling indicates that prisons are an environment where, with the potential for significant transmission of an infective agent such as COVID-19 in a pandemic situation. And some of the reasons behind that include the closed uh, contained conditions, the health status of those people who are in custody, increased prevalence of long-term conditions within that population. Also the fact that we have an aging population. Uh, uh, those are aged 55 and over are the fastest growing age group, uh, and that's reflected nationally and internationally. And also the fact that uh, the health age of people in custody tends to be around about 12 years beyond, 10 to 12 years beyond their chronological age. So typically a person who's 50 and in prison uh, would present with the uh, with the health of a, you know, a 60 to 62 year old. And again, the regimes in prison as well, or the normal regimes in prison, where people move around in the way that they do, uh, uh, presents a risk in terms of increasing the spread of, 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 of infective agents as well. So if we look specifically at the kind of uh, risks that are associated with the provision of opiate substitution treatment in, in, in prison, you can see from this slide, which was a snapshot of OST being delivered in the prisons on a particular day in February earlier this year, yeah, so you can see that on the day when the prison population was 8,005, we had 1,707 people receiving methadone, 170 on some form of uh, generic buprenorphine, five people receiving suboxone, and uh, 169 people on espinor. So on that day, uh, 2,051 people, well, that was 25.6% of the population receiving OST. So if you scale that up for a week, uh, across the 15 prisons, you have just, just under 14,500 administration episodes happening each week. So that's 14,500 episodes where patients are in contact with, with clinicians. In addition to that, uh, we are also supplying around about 9,500 named patient prescription items uh, into uh, the prisons every week. And again, they are supplied to uh, patients in custody through an interaction with uh, nurses or healthcare staff to, to provide those medicines. Uh, so even if we assume you know that you know that people have roughly four prescription items uh, per person, you're, you're then starting to look at somewhere around sixteen and a half, sixteen uh, and three quarters thousand interactions uh, a week between healthcare personnel and patients to provide OST and medicines, and, and obviously that would be a fantastic vector to spread uh, infection if we've got something like COVID nineteen in, in a prison. So with COVID-19 uh, arriving in the UK, we needed to think about uh, how we continue to provide care safely, including OST. Uh, and that then brings me to the third point I want to speak to you about is the contingency planning that we looked at. So when we were aware that COVID-19 was on the horizon, we, we clearly started to plan for that. Uh, and, we, and, we, and we looked at how we could ensure opiate substitution services and how they could be maintained in as safe as possible way. And we had to look at what contingencies would be required to do that. So in relation to normal opiate substitution treatments, as I've just demonstrated from the side, our treatment approaches are based on methadone, solid dose buprenorphine, and uh, esphenor, the, the, the wafer. So we needed to ensure, I guess, as the first part of our contingency planning, that there was resilience in the supply chain, in the supply chain uh, so there were any, if there was any disruption to, to, to the supply due to COVID-19, we had sufficient buffer stock to keep supply happening in the prison. So we worked with uh, the pharma companies that produce these drugs and our pharmacy provider to make sure we had buffer stock within the wholesale that our, uh, that our uh, pharmacy provider uses, just in case there was a, a sudden shortage. And in addition to those arrangements, we worked with the Scottish Government Chief Pharmaceutical Officers, officers Office to ensure that we could get access to the national stockpile of medicines that's maintained by uh, the Department of Health and Social Care in, 
uh, uh, on, 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 in, in the UK. I mean, I'm pleased to say that we were successful in doing that. Uh, and I see Kirsten's uh, popped up, so we've only got a minute or so left. Uh, so I just quickly wanted to, to tell you about, and, and so I'm sure something to be interest, of interest to you about, what we did as a further contingency was, at the time that COVID arrived in the UK, we already had a proposal into Scottish Government to pilot Bouvetal in the prisons. Uh, and when, uh, a, when COVID arrived in the, in, in the UK, I guess we were asked to look at scaling up that pilot. And the basis in which we were asked to look at scaling up that pilot was because uh, of the rationale that we put into the pilot. Uh, and that rationale was saying that, you know, Bouvetal, which you'll all be aware is a, a new formulation of buprenorphine available in a 7 or 28 day depot. Uh, and part of our rationale for, for, for that pilot was to say, we want to test this because we think it's got benefits in terms of patient safety, in terms of protecting, a protecting effect uh, from opiate and opioid drug related deaths. We wanted to increase the choice of treatments for people. We knew there was a potential to reduce uh, issues related to diversion of opiate substitute treatment uh, within the prison environment through Bouvetal, uh, and that might also help address some issues with intimid intimidation and bullying. We also knew that there was a potential to release some nursing time uh, uh, from the daily opiate substitution administration process that could be dedicated back to managing patients who perhaps were suffering the effects of COVID-19. And similarly for SPS operational staff, uh, they could be released to help to support care and undertake other purposeful activities. So, so what did we do uh, to scale that up? Uh, well, to try and scale that up from the original pilot, we went back and produced a fully costed proposal to look at rolling that out across the, uh, the prisons. Uh, we liaised with the pharma company to ensure that there would be sufficient stock in the system to respond to our requests. We liaised with national procurement uh, and the pharma company to negotiate terms of supply for the NHS and we worked with the prison's pharmacy provider to establish a logistics process that would allow Bouvetal to come into the prisons. Then we approached the international community to learn from other clinical colleagues, particularly in Australia and Sweden, who had experience of using Bouvetal in the prisons. And we also engaged with local clinicians in Greater Glasgow and Clyde and Lanarkshire, and also colleagues in Wales, clinical and, and government colleagues who had experience of using Bouvetal to produce a protocol. Uh, those experts contributed towards the protocol. Some of you may have seen that protocol uh, that, that has been circulated. The protocol was published, uh, 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 and boards were told how to access the funding to move forward with that if, uh, if they chose to do so. When that protocol was published, some questions were raised and a further clarification was provided in, in, in relation to that. Uh, and I guess where we are now is that Bouvedal has been made available as a treatment uh, a, a choice uh, during the pandemic period for people in prisons, uh, and uh, that's starting to be used in some locations. And we expect to see uh, that choice being rolled out to other people as we move forward. Uh, I very just quickly want to see one other area that we were involved in in relation to uh, contingency planning with colleagues in the Scottish Drug Forum, and that was to make Nixoid available as a take-home naloxone uh, treatment over this period. Colleagues from SDF were successful in securing funding from the Scottish Government for this, uh, and then we worked with uh, colleagues in STF to make this available uh, as a, an intervention that could be put into uh, people who were going to be liberated as possessions the night before they were liberated, uh, because we recognised that in the current COVID-19 situation, when people were being released early uh, and being on opiate substitution treatments, going back to the community where really opiate substitution treatment administration may not be available, People may be getting three times weekly supply or indeed a seven day supply away with them. There was an increased potential for people to come to harm. We wanted to do as much as we possibly could to mitigate that. Uh, uh, and we've been able to do that through getting additional supplies of Nixoid. And we're working with the boards to distribute that to people who are being released. So I'll wrap up there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Tom. I appreciate it. There was a lot of information to try and cram into 10 minutes there. You could have probably spent 10 minutes on each subject, okay. uh, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you as well. So I'm um, just going to move on quickly then to Mary Mitchell, who is the Clinical Manager in HMP Barlini. So Mary, over to you. Thank you. 
Thanks, Kirsten. Um, good afternoon, people. Um, my name's Mary Mitchell. Um, Andy's got some slides there for you as well, if you want to have the first slide. Yeah, so, I'm Mary Mitchell. Um, I'm the nurse team lead at HNP Berlin. Um, I've been here for a number of years and I, I manage the addiction service. So, if you'd like to be on the next slide, Andy, please. So, just to give you an overview of what Berlin Prison is all about, but Berlin Prison um, was built in 1872. It was built to hold uh, approximately 792 prisoners. The optimal numbers are approximately about 1,030, but we normally hold upwards of 1,400. The most I've seen here um, is 1,750. Um, as of Wednesday, our numbers had actually dropped to 1,079, so it's definitely unprecedented times that we're working in. Um, next slide, please. Um, our services that we're in, uh, that we offer within Berlin, we are, as Tom said, uh, made up of primary care addiction and mental health. So our primary care um, nurse-led services, is, there's a lot of medicine management that goes on. We have also a cohort of non-medical prescribers. Um, we work with our triage, we do wound care, we take students here, uh, we try to recruit students as well. Um, we do clinical assessment and unscheduled care. But nursing staff also work with medical emergencies. And we train um, a lot of our staff in chronic disease management, so they run their own nurse-led clinics made up of diabetic clinics, tissue viability clinics, asthma clinics. Um, our primary care staff are very heavily involved in mental health first aid. Um, they do a lot of teaching, um, training, coaching and a lot of induction for staff. They participate in the Scottish Prison Service um, Suicide Risk Management Module. We also work with healthcare support workers who support with primary care nurses. Um, and they, they support clinics such as phlebotomy, um, ECGs, hydros monitoring on behalf of the nursing staff as well. And they do, um, a lot of our systems have moved forward from the days of paper records, so uh, moved heavily forward with electronic systems. Our medical records are all electronic and a lot of us at work as well. Next slide, please. So the services that support that, the additional services, we have GPs in-house. Um, we have psychiatry services come into us twice a week. We have occupational therapy, we've got a pathway for occupational therapy services. We have dentistry that comes into prison five days a week. We have an optician service and we have a podiatry service and psychology work closely with us as well. Um, and through COVID-19, we've still had to try and manage a lot of these services, but just very differently. Um, next slide, please. So our mental health nurses, and they, they do a lot of mental health triage, and they do assessment of people, they deliver low level psychological interventions. Uh, they case manage um, prisoners uh, while they're here and try to support them uh, with some of their anxiety management, depression, sleep problems, etc. while they're here. They participate in a multidisciplinary mental health team um, along with the Scottish Prison Service. They do a lot of crisis intervention and they spend time with people who are very unwell and try to get them out to hospital. Um, we do a lot of risk management. They do a lot of through care and onward referral to secondary services. They also take part in a care program approach. So even though people might be at hospital, there's a potential for mentally ill people to be returned to prison when they're well. So they work with their colleagues in the community and hospitals and to return people to prison. And they do a lot of medicine management as well. So there's like depot clinics, etc. And again, all these services have it to run in some shape or form throughout this whole pandemic period. Um, next slide, please. So we're addiction nurses, um, again, similar to mental health and primary care service. They do a lot of assessment. They see um, every prisoner who's admitted to prison on ORT, and they will do an assessment of them. And then they will instantaneously link in with community providers um, about uh, managing people's addiction issues while they're in custody. We do a BBB service, so we test, we treat. Um, every prisoner that comes into prison is offered the opportunity to be tested for hepatitis C and HIV. It's a very well uptake service. We have a really good cohort of staff that um, are really influential in persuading prisoners to access that service. Um, that those staff have also been trained in the in an old world. We used to send people out to hospital for five the scans and to get that treatment initiated. Everything is now done in-house and we have a consultant comes in uh, every four weeks to support that team of nurses. Um, and I say team loosely as one nurse and it's one healthcare support worker. Um, we offer harm reduction. They case manage anyone who has an addiction issue who wants support whilst in custody. Um, part of their case management involves the delivery of low-level psychological interventions and most of our addiction staff are all spirit trained. 
uh, we deliver quite your way and I, that, that's done in consultation with uh, our colleagues as well from the um, from our smoking cessation colleagues uh, assist us with quite your way. We have we deliver naloxone. That's been a huge issue obviously for um, people getting out in early release stuff about that a bit later on. Um, but we have a good uptake in people uh, taking part in naloxone. The, the, being able to change it to do what you want interventions uh, has have made a remarkable difference in that. We do a lot of work with relapse prevention. Medication management, or team Pabrodex is a huge part of the addiction uh, nurses' role here. Uh, we can deliver up to about 300 doses of methadone and espronod in some shape or form. I think the most I've seen it here is 450 in a day. It's a, it's a lot of work for a team of nurses. It's a very small team. The deliver through care is really important that people are engaged in services when they get back out. A lot of work done with pre-release um, and there's also an alcohol support service. And again, that team um, consists uh, of nine nurses. So it's, it's a lot of work for, for people to be doing on a daily basis. Next slide, please. So what was the risks of COVID-19 in, in a prison? Well, as Tom said, and everybody said, a condensed population. Um, and at the point of uh, the pandemic come, uh, really taking off, we the majority of prisoners in double cells. So the cells aren't particularly big. I've got about six foot by four foot. They might be slightly bigger than that. But when you get two people in a cell, in bunk beds, um, there's really not a lot of room to social distance. We've got an aged and a frail population, um, and even though we might have an element of young people here, um, they look as though they have aged because they don't look after their health very well. Um, they usually come from high areas of deprivation, um, where people really aren't too bothered about their health conditions, so they come into prison. Their health is generally poor, and they've got usually lots of underlying health conditions. There's very few about prisoners um, on some kind of medication, and lifelong medication. Um, they've usually got a, a kind of lack of general awareness. I think sometimes when people are shielded in prison, it's probably a bit like the community as well. They kind of don't really kind of pay too much attention to what's going on because it's not really affecting them. So for all that people are aware um, of what's going on worldwide, there's still that kind of... Um, no, no need to kind of really worry too much about it, but prisoners have been very, very good um, in how we've implemented some processes such as hand washing, and they've taken to that really well. They've also got a lack of accessibility to manage themselves. Um, on a daily basis, they're controlled by an organisation, so, so they can't make informed choices. They have to come out to go and get their meals. They can't choose to stay by. They have to come out and go to a communal shower area, etc. So there's really that lack of accessibility to manage themselves. Um, we've got a high population of homelessness here, um, so and again, like being homeless brings on its own issues um, in the community. There is a difficulty in social distancing, just because of the, the sheer volume of numbers and the condensed day. Uh, there's just lots of issues which affects the whole social distancing. We have to run a regime to get people to a place, and that may be in crowds, but you, even if you're taking like, 10 prisoners to a place, you can't possibly have a full two metres distance between them. You have to contain them in an area to do certain pieces of work. And there are certain core parts of the day that just must be done. Um, and there's a lack of environmental personal control. They don't have a choice of when they potentially go and do things. So, so that, that makes a huge difference in like what, what, uh, why we've got a huge risk of COVID-19. Um, next slide, please. So some of the contingency um, and the planning and the early release and naloxone, uh, that, that did bring on some issues and some difficulties. Um, the SPS communicate really quite well, the criminal justice, but there was no, no communication with prison healthcare. And that, that wasn't just the prison service, that was criminal justice as well. Um, I don't think a lot of people appreciate that um, in Berlin, in particular, probably all prisons as well, uh, deliberations are Scotland-wide. However, um, your local community justice and criminal justice are really only interested and concentrate on Glasgow City. Um, so we had in the first tranche of early releases approximately um, 19 people released in Glasgow, but 32 from the prison. So the work that brings on the nursing staff and the GP service is quite extraordinary. Um, we had to change some processes for creating liberation appointments. Um, so and previously we would just send an email to somebody's community prescriber and ask for an appointment for that day. Because of COVID-19 and the inability to access GPs and 
services and people not uh, doing face-to-face -face appointments. We've had to create a process with the criminal justice colleagues that allows us to, um, and allows the community to actually pick up people if they can't find them. So we started asking and providing uh, community prescribers with people's uh, mobile numbers, uh, with people's next of kin's, and then how they might get in contact with them, and something that we probably never really thought of, even from uh, the early days, uh, was the chemist that people are actually going to. So at least if someone knows that that's exactly the chemist they're going to go to, they might be able to find them again. Um, some of the good parts about it being the development of community links and a clearer understanding of people's roles have certainly became clearer and had a better understanding of the role of criminal justice, the role of social work, the role of housing, cred, uh, access to universal credits, and it also um, that's came back vice versa as well, that the community have got a better understanding of our role and the fact that we just don't work with um, Greater Glasgow and Clyde patients. But we've had a, a great opportunity to increase for naloxone uptake. We've had uh, many years of battling trying to get naloxone into people's uh, understanding and for patients to access that for liberation. Um, but every, uh, every prisoner who is released on ORT is issued with take home naloxone. There's been the opportunity for nioxid. Um, and we've actually looked at that positively uh, and also the way for the Scottish Prison Service to use. Um, I understand that prison officers might be a bit reluctant to use needles and syringes when you've got access to sedation staff who can administer the naloxone. So we've used that as an opportunity to try and get that um, for the Scottish Prison Service to use if people happen to overdose in prison. There's been the consideration of the change from Espinor to Bouvedal, and that work's still ongoing, but um, it's not quite as simple. Um, it's just swapping somebody from a tablet to an injection. But it's certainly still on the agenda, and high up the agenda, and how we would support patients to actually do that. Um, and we've been working quite closely with the Glasgow pilot that's been operating with Bouvedal. I know that's been very well received, uh, and a lot of patients actually like that, and it's kind of stabilised a lot of patients as well. Um, initially, all prisoners on early release were liberated in one day. We've now managed to work with our Scottish Prison Service colleagues in the criminal justice, and that's been spread over three days. So it's quite robust now. It's safe, um, and there's not bit many flaws in that process. Um, some of the planning, we've got limited access to prisoners to discuss information required, and there's a perception that, um, that uh, being in prison is a captive audience. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because lots of people are trying to do lots of work with lots of prisoners. Um, we have created uh, a health improvement leaflet, a health improvement created the leaflet Change in Your Future, um, and that's health and wellbeing support services, and that's issued to everyone on liberation. And it's really just a pocket sized leaflet, and it uh, covers uh, all sorts of things like domestic abuse, um, put your access to ORT, chemists. Lots of information, but on the back of that, there's been the development of the National Prisoner Network, the healthcare network, um, and you've also had colleagues from other boards supplying you with similar information. So if you have got people going to Lanarkshire or going to Fourth Valley, um, everybody shared all that information I've got. So it's been really, really, really helpful. Um, and last but not least, the information is rapidly changing. So the work that you're having to do is rapidly changing as well. Um, and we have had um, a really good support from our own healthcare staff, so I'd just like to thank all the nursing staff and all the healthcare staff, the doctors, all the services that have come in and made good use of technology to try and deliver a service as best as they can. They've done exceptionally well, so um, I think healthcare's done what it can, can do more, of course it can do more, it can change a wee bit, but they've done exceptionally well in adapting, adapting at short notice from shift changes to using technology to having lots of issues with technology, it's not always run smoothly, and to everybody all pulling together, you've really seen a cohesive teamwork. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary, that's brilliant, and really great to hear about the perspective of how you deliver some of these contingency plans when you're actually on the front line. Um, so I'm just going to ask all the panellists to come back on and also invite my colleague Austin Smith to join us and we'll get some questions going. Hi, uh, I'm delighted to say there's, uh, there's a lot of questions, uh, so if I had to kind of group them. Um, I suppose the first one is around uh, naloxone supply uh, and, and there's various points here, I suppose. One of them is that this is potentially a time of a, a, an increased risk of overdose in the prison, perhaps, but certainly out with it. Um, 
what's been done to increase the supply to prisoners who have been released from remand, uh, which has traditionally been quite a difficult group to uh, manage and get a, a supply to, um, and what's been done with uh, intranasal supply, the new intranasal supply, how's that working and what the success is looking like, how, how many supplies have been made. Uh, and also for within the prison, is it possible to use that intranasal supply uh, for uh, potential overdoses within the prison and be, be, be able to move around the prison more freely, presumably, than something that involved a, a, a needle? Thanks, Austin. Uh, so, yeah, quite a few questions in there. Um, and I guess, Leslie, you were mentioning in your presentation about the increased numbers of people on remand, and that's traditionally always been a particularly difficult a group of people to manage to get naloxone supplies to. So Mary, I don't know if you could start, please, and just some thoughts on, on ensuring access to naloxone for people on release. Yeah, um, we, we don't know um, the any difference between remand prisoners and um, convicted prisoners. We do the same process for accessing naloxone. All the remand prisoners we've got um, the same information as we have for convicted prisoners and people who are on early release. Uh, and it's the same process, so that there's been a, a huge um, uptake in the naloxone. Everybody's worked quite well. We need my prison officer colleagues to catch the issue at the point of liberation. And even when people are going to court, um, they may come back or they may not come back, but we have quite a robust process in place that the, the naloxone goes with them to court. Um, and if they come back, they come back. And if they don't come back, then they've got another problem to. Thanks. And Tom, just in relation to the Nixoid pilot that we're trying to do for people to get access to that overnight before they leave, do you have an update on um, what the challenges are for implementing that and how many prisons are actually involved in it? So at the moment, uh, we have so we have 15 prisons located across uh, nine NHS boards. And at the moment, we've got seven of those NHS boards have said that they want to participate in, in using the Nixoid. So we are now actively involved in distributing the Nixoid to those sites to allow them to get that into people's possessions uh, prior to their liberation so that it's ready and they're waiting for them uh, as they leave. Uh, so that's that's happening as we speak. Uh, and, and again, it's just to reiterate that's that's using the funding that colleagues from SDF were successful in securing from Scottish Government are allowing us to take this process forward uh, 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 and provide those uh, next week through our pharmacy contract for provision to people who, who are being liberated. So we've seen, I, I say, I, I think a good uptake uh, from the boards today in relation to that, and we're pushing to maintain that to ensure that the 500 units that were secured are fully utilised. Thanks. And Mary, just in relation to administration of naloxone within the prison, is that something that's still mostly done by healthcare staff or are prison officers actively involved in being able to administer in an emergency? Yeah, well, so I can only really speak for Berlin and Glasgow prisons. It's, certainly, it's done mostly by nursing staff. Um, so that, that's just a piece of work that needs done. I'm sure it's just like a confidence thing with people. Um, not feeling very comfortable using needles or injecting people with needles and, um, and medication mm. as it's perceived as medication. So it's very much a, a healthcare um, part of the process. Yeah. And I believe the plan was to look at supplying prison officers with intranasal naloxone, but that's not currently in place. Yeah, well, that was something to be picked up on because of the next slide um, availability, and um, that it might give people that bit more confidence to actually use it. Thank you. Sorry, Austin, don't want to dominate the conversation on naloxone, even though you are sporting your T-shirt to market it. Um, yeah, the other, the other cluster questions, or one of the other clusters around uh, Bouvedal, obviously, is a, a source of uh, great interest. Um, one of the questions is about uh, the kind of evidence for that. What, why, what the motive, what's the motivation for moving people onto Bouvedal, and how do you have that balance between what's best for a person you're dealing with as a, as a patient uh, and as a prisoner who you have responsibility for their health and well-being in terms of COVID and so on. So how do you protect people from COVID and what, what the justifications are around that? The other one was about trans, transitioning patients from one medication to another. How, how is that, that done? Uh, obviously, uh, people are, are uh, concerned about being with in withdrawal. So is it possible to transition and have at one point people in small doses of both medications and transfer from one to the other? There's some work being done on that in the NHS. And apparently 
Uh, and the other thing is, is bupropion available to people after liberation? Um, so can you stay on that medication? And if they're on that medication, how do we do through care to make sure people stay in treatment when they, they potentially have, have a few weeks grace, as it were, and they don't have to engage with treatment services because they have their, their depot? Thanks, Tom. Over to you, please. Okay, so a few things I'll try and try to remember. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll take the last point first in relation to through care. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, we understand, you know, that the well, yeah, we understand that boards are looking to uh, see how they can continue Bivital if people are released from custody out into security within Bivital. And we've already had some instances of boards who are saying that they will work to make that happen. So colleagues in NHS Highland have said they will make that happen. And I know uh, just recently there's someone who's currently in custody in, uh, in Fourth Valley who will be returning to Lanarkshire. And I know there's been arrangements made for Bivadal to continue uh, uh, for, for those people when they leave. Scottish Government are actually, have actually pulled together uh, a group uh, to work with the, area, uh, the ADPs uh, another community addiction services to look at how they can be, if you like, uh, more proactive in terms of rolling out the uh, services across the community. So that's that's certainly been very much borne in mind. But I think some of the other points that Austin were round about the evidence base, uh, maybe for treatment and moving people across. As I said, you had we so we had we did work very closely with uh, people in uh, the international community. So the guy called Adrian Dunlop and. Uh, New South Wales has published quite a lot in relation to Bubadal, uh, particularly some called the Unlock Study. So we're really keen uh, and we have engaged with uh, Adrian uh, in relation to our approach. He, he, he helped us put the protocol together as his colleagues from Sweden, as I mentioned, I think, when, when I spoke in relation to, to, to the protocol. Uh, so yes, we are very keen to, uh, to, to learn from their experience and incorporate that and and uh, into what we, we were proposing, and you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, uh, the the whole the, this whole approach was predicated on safety uh, and continuity of care. Uh, I'm sure as you can understand, where our people understand that we we were planning uh, for essentially you know uh, worst case scenarios, I guess. Uh, and I think as I indicated at the start of my talk, uh, public health modelling would tell you that the two worst places potentially to be or two high-risk areas in relation to increased infectivity are care homes and prisons. And we all know what have happened in care homes across the UK as part of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Thankfully, we haven't seen that uh, uh, replicated in prisons, and that's uh, a huge thanks, I guess, to our NHS and SPS colleagues working in collaboration to make sure that that didn't happen. But our whole, uh, whole thinking behind making Bouvardal available as a contingency treatment during COVID-19 was based on continuity of care in a way that would be safe to patients and the staff who had to, who had to deliver that care. Thanks. Um, Leslie, did you have anything you wanted to add on that um, transition on the, and the protocol on Bouvardal and uh, from your perspective? Yeah, so I mean, SPS absolutely would, wouldn't comment on uh, the prescribing of uh, drugs within prison. If you know, when that decision is made. However, uh, we absolutely have a responsibility for the safety of those in custody. And very early at the, the start of this pandemic, we acknowledged that uh, if we, we stopped visits and we stopped movement of people in custody very quickly, any illicit drugs that were um, circulating in the, the prisons were going to dry up, uh, which then meant that those who are currently on um, OST we're at greater risk of being bullied for their medication, and then there's also a greater risk of um, diversion of drugs. But also, the longer this goes on, the, 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 the lower people's tolerance are of drugs. And when we start to come out the other side of this, and, and restrictions are relaxed, and, and uh, things are opened up again, and people have got access to the community again, and more people are coming in from courts, again, we've got the potential of seeing more illicit drugs within the prison and a potential for, for a lot of people to have a uh, reduced tolerance and then the potential for drug overdose. So for us, the fact that Bouvardal was going to help re prevent um, diversion, uh, prevent bullying and prevent overdose, uh, we were more than happy to support it. Thanks, Leslie. Austin? 
Okay, and the last uh, set of questions, I, I fear that Kirsten's chairing this, obviously, but I, this may well be the last things we can talk about. Is a thing that's emerged is a bit of a theme across all the webinars is about legacy from COVID, and particularly potentially a positive legacy. So, are there plans, or is there the possibility to ex uh, continue or extend uh, e-visiting? Is there a, a chance to use technology to improve through care, allowing in reach into the prison to people who are about to be liberated? Uh, and is there a chance for services generally, particularly mental health services, to uh, access uh, and support uh, prisoners through technology rather than visiting the prison? Thanks, Austin. So given that we've just got a couple of minutes left, I'll just quickly come to everybody just for a little one minute thought on that last point. Uh, so Mary, start with yourself. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we've really found, particularly for mental health, um, the use of attend anywhere we use for that has been really successful. However, I would like to lose the face to face contact. I think that's really important for mental health as well. Um, but I do think, like, that ongoing, like, even the psychology work um, and ongoing work for people, I think it would be a bit more personal, you know, as opposed to things get interrupted and they're noisy in halls. I think you've, you've got a, a great opportunity for technology to be involved in healthcare. Um, in certain aspects, but I think there is a lot of stuff that needs to be still done face to face, particularly for mental health. Thanks, Mary. Tom? Yeah, I think the, this, this pandemic situation has really brought uh, telemedicine, telehealth to the fore, and we've seen some innovative approaches towards uh, the, the development of that. Uh, and I can think that uh, you know responses that we've seen in short periods of time to make that happen for me have been very positive. And I think that post the pandemic, that's something we want to build on with colleagues in the SBS. See how we can maximise the use of these appropriately to get people engaged with services as quickly as possible and as appropriately as possible. Because we have seen internationally uh, examples of where that works very well. Thank you. And Leslie, final word. Yeah, so I'd have to say exactly as uh, Mary and Tom have said, the fact that we have been able to introduce tele you know, more telehealth and using technology for attend anywhere. But actually, uh, those in custody are getting greater access to technology as well, and things like that was mentioned by Austin, virtual visits. So people that do live significant distances away from our prisons um, or have difficulties with public transport, be able to virtually visit uh, custody has made a huge difference. But also for me, the, the networks that we have, have developed over the last few weeks and the people that we've started to work much closer with, uh, I hope we don't lose that. And actually, there's a lot of people who have taken interest in prisons that previously weren't engaged in, and I hope that continues beyond this. Thanks a lot, Leslie. OK, so that's us out of time for today. So apologies if we didn't get to your question. We managed to get through quite a few there. Right, so firstly, I'd like to thank all our speakers for joining us today. I really appreciate you giving up your time. It's been really informative, and uh, thanks so much for doing that. I'd like to thank Austin for uh, doing all the questions there, and all the folks behind the scenes, Andy, Andrew, and Sophie, who and manage all the technical side of things and have hopefully managed. Uh, it's been a smooth experience for everyone. Thanks a lot to you all for tuning in. Please do complete your evaluation uh, of this webinar. Uh, next week, on next Friday, we'll have another webinar, and that'll be uh, looking at lessons learned from this pandemic, some of the challenges we're faced going forward as some of the lockdown restrictions are uh, reduced. And all that's left to say is goodbye, and thank you very much, and take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks.